let's look at what household energy needs are there in especially in humanitarian settings uh, so that can put the cooking solutions and fuels in humanitarian settings into perspective um, most of the cooking or let's see the household energy needs are actually going into thermal which is really vital for survival because we all need cooked food and not cooking is not an option because especially in humanitarian settings you cannot just go to a restaurant or go to the supermarket and buy some cooked food already if um, the rations from world food program that is the, um, the most um, frequent source of food and then you just need to deal with that and a lot of this is dry food and it's beans or other things that take a long time to uh, to cook and which are not digestible for the human body without being so much processed so here we are really talking the vital for survival thing and you can see by the size of these bubbles that uh, this is most of the energy normally over 80 percent of the household energy that is uh, used um, in humanitarian settings it's uh, translating to about one kilowatt uh, hour per person per day that has uh, is the result of several studies that have been done. Um, whereas if you look at uh, the other um, energy on the right hand side of that slide, it's mostly electricity bound uh, for lighting, cooling, communication, and so on, which add a lot to quality of life. But you can actually survive it or without a phone or without a radio. It's just that it's not so nice. Um, and if we look at the willingness to invest versus the um, needs of the requirements of energy, it's just the inverse. Um, nobody is really prepared to invest into cooking energy, whereas everybody likes the sexy things about lighting, phone charging, radio, and whatsoever. And the orders of magnitude of the typical energy requirements, they are pretty shocking. Because if you look at a hot plate for cooking, the normal stuff that is out on the market is taking up something like 500 to 1,000 watt. Whereas if you look at one LED light, that's 1,000 times less. So if you want to cook on um, off-grid cooking, you're not winning with the normal um, devices. Whereas we can go towards like slow cookers, that are on the market um, that start already like at 100 watts and they're definitely below 300 watts where we're going into a space where off-grid cooking can become uh, off-grid electrical cooking can become a reality next slide um, what we definitely need to focus on is in any context what is the priority because in humanitarian settings, there are so many priorities and you need to be able to choose between them or at least be aware of them that some of them have different solutions. So if you're in the environmental resource conservation uh, <clears throat> point of view, then like uh, Modo has just uh, pointed out, then you might have to go for a completely different fuel um, that is not depending on the environment uh, sources. If you're concerned with human health, be aware that in many cases um, people are cooking outside the tents, but in some other places people are cooking inside their, their housing, uh, in their shelters, uh, then you have different solutions to consider. Is it for protection that uh, you want to use the fuel gathering of the people um, so that they don't have to leave are you talking cost efficiency? Then first of all, for whom? Who pays for fuels and for stoves? Um, if it's the agency that pays, you have to consider procurement, the transport, the logistics, the distribution of both stoves and fuels. Or if it's the user that pays for things, then you need to consider the affordability of the livelihoods of the people. How does that fit in? What are the solutions that are feasible? And next slide, please. Um, any solution that you're coming up with has to have the user in the center because very often people just focus on what is in between these purple lines the stove but that stove is in a context and it's operated by somebody 
and it's highly dependent on the food that has to be cooked, the fuel that is available, the stove has to go with the fuel. We all know that if you have an LPG stove, um, you cannot put firewood in there, but some people tend to forget these things. Um, if we're talking human health, anything ventilation or exposure related will have an impact on the cooking systems. But in general, if the intervention does not suit the user, there will be no impact. The stove used does not give you any impact. Next slide, please. So if we want to design user-centered uh, cooking solutions, well, we actually have to start with the fuel. Guess why? Because the stove follows the fuel. So there are different things that we can do. You see increased access to clean fuels, and I put the clean fuels in quotation marks. There are no clean fuels. A clean fuel is maybe something that has been processed and refined, so it has an opportunity to burn cleaner than other things that haven't been refined. But it's not in the fuel itself that it is burning and completely. It should increase our chances with higher levels of refinement. But normally, we summarize these so-called clean fuels as the bleens, biogas, LPG, electricity, ethanol, and natural gas. Um, that is not so feasible and realistic in uh, humanitarian settings, because all these things, they are not locally found. You would need to create the supply chains. So. What people very often do is they just go outside the camp and raid whatever biomass they can find. Um, but we can also make that cleaner if we're concerned about uh, human health. Um, we can improve the combustion by preparing that fuel a little better. That can be just by drying the fuel, not going out every day and then sticking wet firewood into some stove. But we can dry it out, we can size it, uh, we can make it fit to the appropriate stoves. And then, of course, we can um, increase the ventilation or just make a sensitization for people that whatever comes out of the stove is not necessarily what goes in the nose and the human system. If we cook in the open or if we have better ventilation in the spaces where we are cooking. So as I said, in that um, um, in the in the picture, you can see that the user is in the center, and there are different types of fuels. And I've actually put out this thing as an energy shelf. You might have heard about the energy ladder, but it's really more a shelf because the user decides which fuel is available, which stove can do the preparation of the fuel, uh, of the food that we have to do in a good way. And parallel usage of multiple fuels and devices is the norm. And it's also a desired uh, situation by the people because not everything cooks the same way or roasts the same way. If at all, we look at environmental and climate focus, go on renewable fuels, that they are marked in green here, and sustainable biomass production because Guess what? Biomass is sustainable if you make it renewable and manage it well. Let's look at a quick decision process. You will get these slides later on, so you can go through and through and through. And uh, you can also find more explanation in publications or uh, Stoves 101 presentation that I've done somewhere else. But next slide, is it there? Quick decision processes on user-centered cooking solutions. The first thing is, any decision on type and brand of device comes last, after the assessment of the needs. Don't start with, oh, this stove could, looks cool, let's do this. Hmm. Start with the fuel, what is available, where, is it suitable for the cooking task, what fuels is the target group familiar with. We just heard about LPG challenges that if people are not familiar with LPGs, it will be very hard for them to become familiar with. But if you have a a fuel that is already known to the ta or at least part of the target group, then it's a lot easier to introduce the fuel and the stoves to go with. 
And you can also ask people what would their preferred cooking fuel be. Asking doesn't harm. If it's possible, that will be found out. But the more the target group is involved, the more the solutions suit the users, the better chances of adaptation you have. Next slide, please. Because otherwise, you end up with this situation that everybody says, oh yeah, solar cookers, they are really great technologies. Well, they are, but they're very impractical because you can't cook breakfast, you can't cook dinner. And it's not very suitable to roasting meat or something else like that. And so it depends really on what people are cooking, what are the food rations. That is very, very context specific. And otherwise you end up with this, we use the solar cooker as an icebreaker because everybody gets gets excited and they stop by to chat, but it's not used for the intended purpose of cooking, right? Um, next slide. So if we're looking at the energy from solid biomass, there's nothing wrong with biomass as long as it is coming from a sustainable source, which in humanitarian settings, to be honest, becomes a challenge. But it's not that we have to just really phase out biomass by force. We can as well start looking at it in a, in a way that we do something about the availability. Because biomass energy is solar energy stored by a plant, so the biomass is actually our battery. It's renewable and climate neutral if we've managed the sources well. It's available on demand. It's not like you have a blackout and then you can't do anything about it, but you can make your own storage of uh, the um, firewood safe and easy to store, no disposal in issues, it cannot explode, and it has got a reasonably high calorific value as long as it is dry. So next slide. If we compare the um, cooking fuel choices that we have, uh, things that you need to consider is the bulk volume, calorific values, the state, is it solid, liquid, or gaseous? What do I need to transport? Uh, what are the costs of procurement? How are my distributions going? For example, if I choose a liquid fuel, I need a different type. Either I need packaging or I need a tanker for liquid. I cannot just put things on somehow a truck. If I'm considering gas, I have to also consider that my gas is only not even half of the weight, but I need to transport the empty cylinders as well or I need to have a refueling station, a refueling station somewhere hand, handy. So biomass, it's firewood is actually not bad comparing into bulk volumes and calorific values if I'm comparing it with other fuels. Let's go next slide on continuing our decision process. The cooking needs come after the fuel. Who needs to cook what and how? That depends on the type of food, so often depending on the food rents, the cooking time, the duration of cooking, the type of cooking, if people have to do boiling, roasting, baking, the heat type required, do I need to adjust heat, do I need low heat, high heat, how big is my turn down ratio that I need, and very, very important, the shape and the type of the cooking vessel. That very often depends on UNHCR giving out um, the parts. But it also depends on culture. You see in the photo there, that is the Somali injera, um, very common in the Eastern Ethiopian refugee camps. And that is a little um, like a, a wok size pan. Then um, that needs to fit on the stove and it needs to be handled by a stove. So very often, if you have a stove, it has got like a skirt around it, you cannot use that Somali injera and then people will not use um, the stoves and then you find the stoves upside down on a roof ten, uh, roof as protecting the roof so let's look at different types of um, solid biomass fuels next slide please um, that you can categorize by substance and shape it's either uncarbonized naturally found fuels or the carbonized and then that's the shape anything log shape that you can push from the side can go as in any stove that is designed for firewood stove, whereas anything else that is smaller size or carbonized has to have special types of stove. Charcoal stoves are very um, known in many places, but the process of making charcoal is very wasteful. Um, so it's better to use uncarbonized fuel. You need to have the fuel and the stove both 
available. So very often that is not feasible in a humanitarian setting. Next slide. Um, if we now cook, look at the cooking environment, where do people cook? Next slide, please. We have a lot of factors and that are influencing the human health and the so-called clean cooking energy systems. But it, there are many factors that influence that. It's the stove, the type of choice and uh, of stove and the techniques, how to prepare the fuel if it's moist fuel, the stove will smoke, even if it's a so-called clean stove. The user behavior is important if you have the, the people leaving the kitchen, cooking outside, and in the ventilation, all the air exchanges um, matter. If you have cross ventilation, if you have openings, all these things matter and not only the stove. Next slide, please. So we add another um, layer, the size and the type of device to our decision-making process. Like what are the pots? What are the pot sizes? Which type of operation uh, people do need and would be what is acceptable? Like, again, I'm sticking with this uh, Somali injera plate. If that does not fit on a stove, that stove will not be used. And then we just have um, unused stove. In general, next slide, please. We need to give users appropriate options. Not only what we think they need, but what they need and what they want so that they are likely to use it regularly. Because again, a stove not used has no impact. So the top line that you see here is an example from Tanzania. It's the same basic stove body, but it has, um, it's, it comes in different forms. One is just installed in mud. The other one is as a standalone thing. It can be used as for, with firewood and with charcoal because it's got a little grate there. And then we have the more high-end version of it uh, that comes in a metal cladding. And that is more for the for urban populations or where you have to transport the stoves for a longer distance. And give people options. If people want a pink stove or a purple stove or a green stove, give it to them have them choose what they want. So we come to summarizing. Um, next slide, please. This is really just for you a checklist on going through. And now the last thing is brand selection. And there you have also a list of stakeholders with whom you should be consulting. And now next slide, how to select a brand now. You've done all your homework on what needs to be done, what would be um, suitable for the people, and now you can go on that clean um, cooking catalog and you can then select the brand based on performance, based on um, availability, on cost and whatsoever, right? But brand selection comes last. Don't choose a stove. Oh, this is going to be a great stove. No. First, look at what is needed. So there is, again, next slide, please, a recap on decision making for cooking. Then you can uh, go through also what is what would you need in the short term, what would be a suitable energy mix, an immediate least cost energy mix, um, and where would you maybe transition into uh, in the long and medium term to address cooking energy security. And then next slide, last not least, some things to just go through, keep in mind, are we talking free distributions? Are we talking market-based approaches? Like for example, in situations of projected crisis in one location or what is it? Context matters. And again, cooking energy starts with the fuel. Where does it come from? Can you grow something? Can you bring it through markets? Um, and then there will be a lot of other question marks that will come up in the context when you're analyzing it. But one piece of advice, get expertise before wasting resources, your time or money or anybody else's patience. There are a lot of experts out there and some of the experts are presenting here as well. That's just what I can do to close up and thank you very much. Thank you, Krista. I'm pretty sure there could not have been a better overview than this, and especially the decision diagrams that you showed would be helpful to all of our listeners. 
I know you have to leave early, so I will quickly address one question that came in during your presentation. So the question is, can an organization can so what do you think an organization can focus on conservation, human health, protection, and cost efficiency? Or is it better, better for an organization to just take one of the areas and just focus on one topic? Krista? I'm saying you have to first analyze what is it that you think you want? What is it that the target group thinks they want? And you will have probably conflicting um, uh, priorities. And then you just have to have a discussion process within your organization. What is it that you want? Because to be honest, clean cooking is not on the highest point of priority. So if you as an organization go in and say, I want clean cooking, first define what clean cooking means to you. And then mm, check out what is it actually the priorities of the host community, of the target community, and then find a solution where everybody can be happy. Superb. Then I just have one more question that about the slide, uh, second slide that you were talking about, where it said that um, there is usually less willingness to pay for cooking solutions as compared to others, uh, like for example, lightning maybe. Is it because also of the gendered component to it? Because cooking is mostly done by women who have who tend to mostly have less decision decision making power. You nailed it. That is <laughs> quite true. Because um, I call the, the cooking energy the female energy, but it's the male who holds the cash. So he'd rather have a radio or a phone or whatsoever. And ah, that's just women's stuff, you know. She can manage. Yeah, that's unfortunately the truth. <laughs>